missiles didn't get it, but it came in and made a big hole uh, in Norway. So um, we have a great man here, Rick Oliver. I met him several years ago. He came in, and I just met him in the parking lot, and he came in and just identified right away. This brother is a brother, knew nothing about his background. He said, I can do something about Mount St. Helen. And I said, great. And um, well, I'll tell you, ever since then, my life has been enriched by fellowship with Rick and with his teaching. And he came here and did a class, a three-hour class nonstop for our teenagers in the eighth. We have preschool through the eighth grade. And for our seventh and eighth grade class, and being the pastor, I watched the kids during that time. And no one lost attention. And these, these are rowdy eighth graders. <laughs> And they, di they didn't lose attention. He held their attention, gave them information, three hours. So praise the Lord. And let's all welcome Rick. Thank you. Thank you. I think I'm on. Well, this is a pleasure and a delight. As John said, this is, I feel like coming home here. Um, my wife and I bought a house out in Tonto Basin, uh, three years ago, and I called my brother who lives in Mexico and said, man, I bought this really nice house out by the lake, great bass fishing in Tonto Basin, and he started laughing. And I said, what's, what's so funny? He said, you know what Tonto means? Fool. <laughs> I figured, okay, thanks, brother. But aren't these guys great? They bless me. I've had the pleasure, my wife and I, of being uh, at Mount Hermon Christian Conference Center in the Santa Cruz Mountains. Uh, this is my 13th year there. Uh, prior to that, I developed program and taught school and I uh, developed uh, curriculum for Chuck Smith for Calvary Chapel for the Green Valley Camp. And when I moved up to Mount Hermon, that was a big step for me. I'm the superintendent of school for our outdoor science school. And that means that we have about 5,000 kids a year coming through that program. And they come from all over the place. In fact, we have schools from Orange County, San Bernardino, coming all the way to Mount Hermon to hear the truth. And God has just opened so many doors. And it's just been such a blessing to be up there. And the Pierce family has been one of those blessings. In fact, next weekend, they'll be at Mount Hermon for a week. They're doing our fam one of our family camps, and then you'll be back again at the end of the summer. Um, by their tapes. On my playlist here, it just says Pierce family, Pierce family, Pierce family. <laughs> just a delight to know them, and they have blessed us greatly. But today, uh, this afternoon, tomorrow, uh, as Roger said yesterday, um, he condensed, guys, I'm condensing a whole semester into these next 14 hours. Or wait a minute, no, I only get two, no, I, that's... <laughs> But guys, there's so much good stuff going on. But I thought it would be best to start at the beginning. Who am I? Why would you want to hear me? Well, who cares? You know, as Christians, why, do we, why should we worry about this creation evolution stuff? You know, I mean, God's word, that's good enough. Who cares about all that other stuff? Well, guys, the foundation is critical. What you build your foundation on is so important. I don't care what kind of space age technology you build the building out of. If your foundation isn't solid, it's going to fall on your head. And as a teacher, I was so appalled at what I was seeing. I taught high school for years. And guys, I didn't accept Christ until rather late in life, one month after my 40th birthday, 40 years out there. Now, I thought I was a Christian before that, and then I decided I didn't even want any part of it. And so... I became an anti-Christian. Atheism was way too passive for me. Now, I got all kinds of degrees and letters and stuff. And, you know, I belong to the California Academy of Science. The new, I was elected to the New York Academy of Science. I was on the board of directors at UC Santa Cruz. I have a PhD in evolutionary biology. I have two master's degrees. I have one in education and one in geology. See, guys, I set out to prove that God was a myth. I felt it was my duty as a scientist to protect those poor, ignorant Christians from that myth. And if one of my students dared to admit they were a Christian or challenge me in my classroom, I annihilated them. So when I did accept Christ in 1987, guys, I came kicking and screaming. 
it was, it was, it was a fierce battle. And I had this guilt that was just, just horrendous because I knew I'd given <clears throat> lower grades to some of my kids just because they were Christians. Now, I base this lecture on Romans 120, we are without excuse. But I called it faith without excuse. <clears throat> Guys, you do not need an excuse for your faith. God says by faith we'll know, not by evidence. What kind of evidence would it take? And if we had absolute empirical factual evidence, what kind of faith would that require from you? But what I don't like and what really upsets me is when I see the kids today being taught what to think, not how to think. Guys, it is your responsibility as parents and grandparents to build that foundation. And you need to build it solidly. And you need to have the comfort that it's okay. You know, it is okay for us to have different opinions. You know, I bet there's probably one or two of you out there have a different opinion than me. I'll change that. But, no. <laughs> <laughs> but seriously, it's okay to have different opinions. But you know what is not okay? It's for me to stand up here and inflict my opinion on you as fact. And that's what's happening. You know, it's okay to disagree, have different opinions, but we need to have room for it all. Guys, we need to just lay the evidence out there. God created every one of you with a brain. And he gave you the ability to make choices. Good news, though. It's not too tough. There's only two. Two choices, folks. Man's word or God's word. Where are you going to put your faith? How big is your God? And here's the exciting part. They are both creation or evolution, whichever side you fall on. They're both religions, folks. One is a man-based religion. One is a God-based religion. They are both faith-based. So I don't care if you're a creationist or an evolutionist, we're going to squeeze it out. You're going to come to the exact same word at the bottom. Faith. It's just where you choose to put your faith. And why are you putting it there? And so hopefully over the next uh, couple of uh, hours that we have to spend together this weekend, uh, we'll be able to just lay some material out there, point you in the right direction, and let you use the brains God has given you to find the answer. Now, I firmly believe that we need to, to start with the basis of who you are and what impact are you having. When I saw this, when I read this this article in the New York Times, I was absolutely shocked at first. And then it dawned on me, I speak all around the country. And I see people, especially Christians, sitting dead in the pews, having no impact. And so when I read this, this guy sitting dead at his desk for five days, I thought, wow, isn't that sad that a man can sit dead in his desk and nobody notice? But isn't it sad that you as a Christian can sit dead in your pew and nobody notice? What impact are you having on your family, on your friends, your neighbors? Read this with me. It says, bosses of a publishing firm are trying to work out why no one noticed that one of their employees had been sitting dead at his desk for five days before anyone asked if he was feeling okay. George Tucklebaum, 51, who had been employed as a proofreader at a New York firm for 30 years, had had a heart attack in the open plan office he shared with 23 other workers. He quietly passed away on Monday. But nobody noticed until Saturday morning when an office cleaner asked why he was working during the weekend. His boss, Elliot Washeski, said, George was always the first guy in each morning and the last to leave at night, so no one found it unusual that he was in the same position all that time and didn't say anything. He was always absorbed in his work and kept much to himself. So the post-mortem examination revealed that he had been dead for five days after suffering a coronary. George was proofreading manuscripts of medical textbooks when he died. <laughs> I wonder if he's reading on heart attack. You know so you may want to give your coworkers a nudge occasionally. I love this. The moral of the story, hey, don't work too hard. Nobody notices anyway. But isn't that sad that a man sat dead at his desk for five days and nobody even noticed? But guys, I see it all the time. I see it across this country. I see it in the churches and the schools. And it's sad. We as Christians sit dead in our desks. And God says, go. You know, make a difference. Guys, I am not here today to prove or disprove anything. If you came here, 
looking for a fight or looking for proof, then you, know, you may not want to come back. Because this is not my job. God doesn't require me. He doesn't need any scientist to prove his word, does he? But what I can do and what I hope to do, and my prayers are that you will walk away here with just a different understanding. You will have a comfort to know that it is okay to put your faith in God's word. I want to present some alternatives and let you then use the brain God has given you to decide where you land. You know, people are all the time going, well, you know, I'm a creationist. Well, you know, I believe in God. Well, so does Satan. You know, what kind of creationist are you? You know, what kind of evolutionist are you? You know, are you uh, young earth, day, age, gap theory, theistic evolution? Where? You know, intelligent design, by the way, doesn't mean you're a Christian. I have some great friends who are great scientists that are not Christians, but are in the intelligent design movement. They don't believe in the same God I do. But you know, there's seven models of creation, seven models of evolution. Are you uh, Darwin, Neo-Darwin? Uh, are you, how about punctuated equilibrium? You like that? Isn't that a cool term? That just means that evolution occurred so fast we didn't see it happen. There's all of these different models and different understandings that people come to. But guys, how do you do that if you don't have all the information? So my goal is to just point you in the right direction and let you know there are alternatives. <clears throat> but right here's where we got to start. We got to start and end and stay in God's work. Now, I like this one. See, I'm an undercover Christian. I can carry this thing around. Nobody even knows I have it, especially with some of the clothes I wear. You know, I walk in and sneak right up on them. The outdoorsman's holy Bible. But guys, this is where it is. Jesus answered and said to them, Matthew 24, 4, speaking to his disciples, he says, take heed that no man deceive you. Do you catch the significance of that? No man deceive you. Because guys, God will not deceive you. But if you put your faith in man's word, you will be deceived. It's not you might or you could or you, you will be. But I love this. Chuck Missler is a great uh, friend and he always goes to this. Acts 17.11. Check it for yourself. This is Acts 17.11. It says, These Bereans were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched, what? They searched the scriptures daily whether these things were so. Guys, that's where we get into trouble. That's where I got into trouble. See, prior to going into high school, if you'd asked me if I was a Christian, I would have said Yes. Because I, I thought all you had to do to be a Christian was be born in America, pray before meals, and you had to go to church. And I met those requirements. But there's a little more to it. Because what I see happening is people putting their faith in man's word over God's word. And if you do that, guys, I have read all the commentaries. I've read Spurgeon, Moody, Swindoll, Luther, Chuck Smith, you name it. And it dawned on me, you know what? Those are great men. I love those guys. But they're sinners just like me. Guys, I am a sinful, fallen human. So if I put my faith in those books, I'm asking for trouble. I have a couple of books here I wanted to show you. And I thought it was really sad. These are both of them the same title. I bought this one at Borders about a month ago. It says, The Origin of the Species by Charles Darwin. And... I looked inside, you know, figuring, well, maybe that's just the cover. Where's the rest of the title? Oh, here it goes. The Origin of the Species by Means of Natural Selection by Charles Darwin. And I kept looking and kept looking. There was something missing, the rest of the title. Guys, I had to go back and order this one from Borders, and it was last published in 1977. It says, The Origin of the Species by Charles Darwin. You open it up, and in here they finally had the whole title. It says, The Origin of the Species by Means of Natural Selection or the Preservation of Favored Races in the Struggle for Life. Do you catch that? Why do you suppose they left out that part of the title? The kids today don't even know that part of the title is in there because none of the books or the textbooks have the whole title. Isn't that interesting, politically correct? That's why I love 
Dr. Martin Luther King's statement. He says, attack the false idea, not the man who holds the idea. Now, we are told to run a good race. And guys, that's hopefully what we will be able to do. But to run the good race, you need to be totally prepared. You need to have all the information. And when I saw this, I, I, this was taken in my younger days. Back when I was a little bit, I used to run triathlons and run all these things. And, and I was an absolute fanatical, obsessive, environmental wacko. I had no problem eliminating the surplus population. Of course, I was going to be the one to say who was the surplus, you see, all of my buddies. And so this was back in my day. Take a watch. Watch what happens. You'll, you'll see me coming into the picture here in just a minute. There I come. I was a little quicker then. <laughs> I like the look on that cheetah's face. Yeah. <laughs> But guys, that's the way I felt. Save everything but the people. You know, God says for us to be good stewards. God created it and he declared it good. So we need to be careful. But guys, we do not worship the creation instead of the creator. And there's where I started running into problems. Here, good place. In the beginning. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Uh, that's a pretty straightforward statement. I mean, it's hard to mess with that. In the Greek, Hebrew, or however else you want to do it, it says God created the heaven and the earth. And what difference does it make to us as Christians how he did it? Why do we get so wrapped up in how he did it instead of why he did it? See, I think Satan just gets off that deception. Remember Matthew 24, 4? Guys, when it says, take heed that no man deceive you, that deception, guys, is very subtle. The deception just slowly creeps in and just gets off kilter. I found this a rather interesting statement. Uh, this is from the journal Science. And I'm going to talk about a lot of the journals and most of the material I use are from the secular communities like I told you I belong to the National Academy of Science California Biology Teachers Association the California Science Teachers Association all of this stuff you know my mom pointed out what PhD stands for piled high and deep you know? <laughs> boy she got it right but I have this book this was written by Michael Roos and Michael Roos is the uh, he's a professor at Florida State University and the author of many books but he got it right. He is definitely not a Christian. But look what he says. In his book, The Evolution-Creation Struggle, Michael Roos interprets the last 200 years of conflict between biology and religion as a struggle between evolutionism and creationism. Evolutionism is not merely an endorsement of the scientific theory of evolution. It consists of the whole metaphysical or ideological picture built around or on evolution. As such, this is where he got it right. It constitutes a secular religion. Thus for Roos, a philosopher of science at Florida State University, the debate over creationism and evolutionism is more a conflict between two religions than one between religion and science. Do you see? That's what I was trying to tell you. This is not an argument about science. It's a discussion, it's a debate over two religions. And guys, they are both faith-based. And I'm going to talk tonight, I'm going to give you a definition of what the National Academy of Science, how they have defined science. And then let's see what their definition is and how creation and how evolution fit within their definition. Guys, according to the definition by the National Academy of Science, neither one of them fit the criteria to be taught in a science classroom. So why is it then that we can teach one and not the other? And see, that was one of the areas that started for me my downward spiral till in 1987. I ended up at a church I swore I would never set foot in. Guys, I used to go down as a teenager and throw water balloons at the baptism. I grew up in 40 years in Newport Beach. And they had all these Jesus freaks down there. And they would go down to this cove in Colonel Mar and 
and baptize people. My friends and I would sneak up on the bluff and throw water balloons. I kept trying to hit the ball guy that was baptizing. <laughs> Pastor Chuck. Guys, I was baptized in that same cove. My wife and I were married by Chuck. I was baptized by Chuck, and I worked for him for three. God has a sense of humor. I'm still here. But sometimes we get so enamored with ourselves. We have a bigger picture of ourselves than who we are, and we get so big that we try to bring God down to our size, feeling that we're on his equal. That's the problem. See, what is your perception? Do you ever hear that old saying, perception is not always reality? What do you think this guy's perception of himself is? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think he perceives himself to be a little more than he is. Now, at Mount Hermon, beautiful area up in the, the Redwoods, up in the Santa Cruz Mountains, and the kids call me Ranger Rick. I, you know, I dressed kind of like a ranger, and it's kinda, it was a lot nicer than some of the things I'd been called, so it stuck. <laughs> but I had this huge German shepherd. She was the biggest female German shepherd I'd ever seen, and I felt cool walking my big German shepherd, you know, Ranger Rick with his German shepherd. Men, women, and children would clear a path, except for these little guys. These guys would come out there, nah, 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 get right in her face. And I'm thinking, what is this? What can this little thing, I guess it's a dog. <laughs> As Roger said last night, you know, you can mess with the dog kind. You, know, you can get German shepherds and you can get chihuahuas. and At least one of them's a dog anyway. But, <laughs> but these, these guys would come out there and snap. And I'm thinking, my dog must be thinking, oh, good, here comes a snack. But isn't it amazing how these little guys just think they are so big and so bad? Guys, that's what happened to me. That's what happens to us in the scientific realm. And I'm not here to badmouth scientists. I am one. Because I don't think it's fair as a scientist that we stand up and try to intimidate people with our vocabulary. You know, if I stand up here and tell you about some of the fun things. I love scutellata scutellatus is one of my favorites. Rhynchocephalians testudinatus. Man, that just... Yeah, I see a lot of blank looks. You see? Now, Pastor John assured me most of you had the periodic table of elements on your fridge, so I mean, we're going to go for it here, guys. Come on. But you notice we use words like that, and that was one of my tricks. If a student dared to challenge me in my classroom, I would usually just intimidate them. Or I would baffle them with terminology. And if that didn't work, then I would go to another discipline. See, that was always the trick. I would just run over to, you know, if they're, I, I'm a biologist. And so if I couldn't handle the question, I would say, well, you know, the geologists, saw, they have that figured out. Of course, the geologists are saying the biologists, and the biologists are saying the geologists, and the physicists are saying. And if all else failed, I could always hide in quantum physics. Because that's weirder than science fiction. My little pea brain doesn't go there. And so I figured the students couldn't either. But see, when I use words like that, they are very important words, by the way. It's really nice to know those words when you're speaking with Chinese scientists. But why is it I have to intimidate you? You know, if I tell you dendrochronology, everybody say that word. Isn't that cool? Dendrochronology. Doesn't it sound cool? You know how much money that word cost me? <laughs> but what if I were to tell you that just means tree ring dating? Now we're on the same page. You see how slick it is? Dendrochronology and carbon-14 can be used, you know, or I can just say tree ring dating and carbon can help you come to a ballpark figure. You know, guys, that's what we've got to stop doing, trying to whack each other over the head and, and getting in these arguments. And we've got to bring ourselves down to understand that we're not nearly as big as we think we are. And our God is big. Way bigger than we are. And God will not be mocked. Galatians 6, 7. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Because you're not going to get over on God. You may get over on your teacher. You may get over on your kids or over on each other. But you will not get over on God. But we keep trying. This is the quote from Dr. Martin Luther King. Great man. Look at this. Attack the false idea, not the man of the idea. Man, when I read that quote, I said, this is it. I found my motto, my life's verse. 
And then it dawned on me, that's pretty tough, isn't it? Because I find that if you attack my ideas, my ideas are pretty firmly attached to me. So it's a really neat goal. And so we need to be careful, folks, how we approach each other. You know, it is okay to have different opinions. Honest, it really is. Let's give each other room. But let's make the final decision based on this word, God's word, not on each other or on what some commentary says. See, who am I? Who is Swindoll? Who is Spurgeon? Who is Chuck Smith to tell you which parts of this are true and which aren't? See, the only way I found the truth was to open the book myself. Boy, that was a novel idea. Read it. Ask the Holy Spirit, the person who wrote it, to decipher it for me. Then I started to discover the truth. And guys, it's a daily struggle. But this is where the truth is. This is not a science book. It's not a textbook. Because i got news for you. Everywhere it touches on science, it's fact. Every book that I have ever used, the books I use to teach my students, the books that I use to, to do my research, are all outdated. This one still stands. Take heed that no man deceive you. Ecclesiastes 8.17 no one. Look, see, God tells us right here. No one. It doesn't say most people, some people, ignorant people, only scientists can. It says no one can discover everything God has created in our world, no matter how hard they work at it. Not even the wisest people know everything, even if they say they do. You ever run into some of those? I was one of those. See, I felt I knew everything. I would put myself on an equal with God. No one can discover everything that God has created. But guys, we can go find the right area. We can stay in God's word. Ask the person who wrote the book. Now it started for me in Wofford, Kentucky. Anybody, I know there's some Kentucky people here. There's a, there's a guy here that grew up probably 20 miles from where I was born and raised in Wofford. Wofford, Kentucky is a little bit remote. When I was growing up there, it was population about 400. Today it's about 395. Guys, it was a rather remote area. In fact, if you look at that building right in the center there, see, we didn't have a bathroom in the house. That's a picture of my dad and my brother and I. We stopped at Grand Canyon on the way out to California in 1958. Now, if you'd asked me at this point if I was a Christian, I would have said, oh, yeah, of course. Because I had to go to church because my grandmother had a motivator. It was called a willow branch. <laughs> She'd flick that and get you going. We prayed before meals. I was born in America. That's all there was to it. A little more to it, though, the relationship. Now, I thought that was really interesting. Here I'm growing up in, in Wofford, Kentucky, and the school I went to was this big square building. It was nowhere near this size. Maybe half of it. Maybe the size of this center aisle. This big square brick building. You knew what grade you were in by what row you sat in. It was K through 8. And if you're in one end, you were in kindergarten. On the other end, you were in 8th grade. And there was no bathroom in the house there either. And guys, before I could go to school, I had to go outside and draw the water out of a well because we didn't have a pump inside the house. So I'd go take a bucket, sit on the sink, go collect the eggs at the hen house. And then I could go to church or to school. And I got down to school, there was no bathroom there either. And to show you how exciting Wofford, Kentucky is, people came over from miles. When my uncle uh, went up to Cincinnati to a trade show, which was a great deal. Everybody gathered around. They wanted to hear, you know, Cincinnati. He went all the way to Cincinnati. Wow, you know, it's like going to another world. Well, he came back and he had a pump that could be put down into the well that would pump the water into the house. And so all the neighbors and relatives are putting pipes in and they're going to put this sink in with the faucets and then he gets this idea well why don't we put one of them white thrones in well that was kind of exciting except for there's no bathroom in the house he said ah no problem we'll just put it in the back bedroom yeah that's all right except it was my bedroom <laughs> and show you how exciting here they just cut a hole in the floor slapped this sucker down there and people came for miles on Friday night I bet you guys do this you go over to your neighbors and sit there and watch the toilet flush I have to clear it, Clem. Where do you suppose that's going? <laughs> and the next thing I know, 
I'm in Newport Beach, California. Zoom, right straight. Look like the Beverly Hillbillies. You know, we piled everything we had on a 54 Ford station wagon, and away we went. And I remember the first time I saw the Pacific Ocean, we were coming down this hill at MacArthur, and I looked out there, and I said, I declare, Ma, I ain't never seen no lake that big. I was wearing Oshkosh before they were cool, you know. Well, I'll tell you about culture shock. Wofford, Kentucky, and Newport Beach are definitely different. And I remember my first day of school, I'm walking down the sidewalk. Most of the kids are being dropped off by their chauffeurs, you know, the Rolls Royce. John Wayne lives six blocks from us, you know, and the Rolls Royces and Mercedes and BMWs are dropping people off, and I'm walking down the sidewalk with my Oshkosh, and I have my little brown bag with my bologna sandwich in it, and, and I walked up to that school, and I'm just, I mean, I was terrified. And I walked into the classroom, you know, and the teacher did a terrible thing. She saw me, and she said, oh, class, here's a new student, and she calls me up front. Now, that's a dumb thing to do to a kid. And I'm standing up there, and I, I'm looking at these people looking, and, and she says, this is little Ricky from Kentucky, and what am I supposed to do? I just said, howdy, y'all. <laughs> Kids can be merciless. They shaped my bologna sandwich into different shapes. It was a rather rough time. Fortunately, I was pretty good size for my age. I, I really caught on to water sports, and so things smoothed out pretty quickly. But if you'd asked me then if I was a Christian, I would have said yes, for the same reason. I was born in America. But then this thing started happening. I started having these flashes of insight where I thought I knew more than my parents. You know, that happens from time to time. And then it really happened. I turned 14, and that's when that hormone kicks in that gives you all wisdom. <laughs> Boy, it kicked. Pew. Now I know I know more than my parents, you know. And it was so exciting. It was the most exciting day I can remember. 14, I got to go to high school. I was a science freak. I loved all kinds of science. Now I could go to a real lab and maybe blow up things. I mean, all kinds of fun science. And I'd been taught to respect my elders, and particularly teachers. In fact, when I left Kentucky, my grandmother said, Ricky, what are you going to be when you grow up? And, yeah, I had all the answers, pilot fireman, policeman, something, you know, said, you ought to be a teacher. I said, why is that, Grandma? She says, because teachers taught all them other people how to be them things. Uh, she's a wise woman. I became a teacher. But if I had ever been sent home for disrespecting a teacher, guys, I would have paid dearly. Spankings were in order. So I, didn't, I wouldn't even think about disrespecting a teacher. And so I had this great reverence for teachers. And so when I got into high school, my favorite teacher, my first period, I, most of my friends were taking study hall or something. I took science. And I remember walking into the class and this tall, good-looking graduate of Pepperdine University, science major, plus he was the freshman football coach. And I played football. And I walked into that class, and there he stood. He was looking cool, man. Tall, good-looking guy. Saddle shoes, Ivy League looking. And he's just sitting there watching, you know. And I walked in and saw him standing there. I said, hello, God. There he was. Great athlete. Great scholar. And he waits till everybody gets in. And he's got these boxes. And he starts opening the boxes and moving around. And he writes his name on the board and turns around and says, hi. I'm Mr. So-and-so. Welcome to your first day of high school in science. And then he did something that changed my life. He kind of leans forward and he looks out and he says, before we get started, I have to ask the question. Now, remember, this is the early 60s. He said, is there anybody in this class that's a Christian? I said, what? What kind of a question is that to open your first day of school in, high, in science? Said, that's nuts. And I looked around the room, and there were several hands went up. So I figured, I'm one of those. You know, I'm a Christian. I raised my hand. And then he smiled, and he says, let me apologize to those of you who just raised your hand and said you were Christians. He says, because by the time the semester is over, you probably won't be. Wow. My heart flipped. My stomach tied knots. I'm thinking, what is this? And I'm, st you, know, I, I, you know, at 14, you got all these hormones and emotions going on anyway. And I thought, you know, had I been lied to? My mother, my grandmother, were they lying to me? And immediately he starts handing out these books. Charles Darwin, Origin of the Species. And he immediately started to tell us about this evolutionary process, how this little warm pond, and we evolved from this simple cell right on up through a more complex, through the lineage of the apes right on through to man. My Uncle Bill really wasn't my uncle. It was a monkey. 
guys, I was, I was, I was angry, I was confused, I, all of these emotions. And you know when he said, by the time the semester's over, you probably won't be a Christian? Well, guys, I got news for you. By the time the day was over, I wasn't. I made a conscious decision that I would not accept that. I, I was too sophisticated. I, I'm a science person. I, I, I couldn't wait to get home. And I remember getting off the bus, and I walked in the house, called my mom over. You know, at 14, it was cool. I'm taller than my mom now, you know. And come here, mom. And I majored in obnoxiousness, so I had this advantage anyway. So I put my arm around her, looked at her, this big grin, and I said, Mom, I'm 14. I'm in high school. You can take this Jesus business and put him over Santa Claus and the Easter Bunny. Science has the answers. Guys, that was not a smart thing to say to a good Southern Baptist prayer warrior woman. She turned downright hostile. <laughs> and she's a sweet lady. But I'm telling you, she got really, I knew I was in trouble because the color drained out of her face, the veins are sticking out. <laughs> she looks at me, and I knew I'd had it because the finger came out, and it went right on my nose, and she's backing me across the room going, <sighs> she couldn't even talk. <sighs> There'll be none of this talk in this house, young men. And she starts quoting scripture. She reaches out and grabs Bible. They were hanging from the ceiling on the floor in her pocket. She had Bibles, men. And you know, she actually wrote in them. She had red marks and yellow marks and stuff. She was a Jesus freak. And she starts quoting all this scripture. And I just smiled and looked at her. And I pulled out my Darwin. And I started quoting Darwin. Guys, she was a great prayer warrior woman. I am here today, not because of some great commentary, some preacher, some track, some tape. I'm here because my mother and my grandmother never stopped praying for me. Prayer works. Thank you. That's true. This is the first lecture I've done. My mom passed away in March. I know where she is. It used to terrify me. I, I spoke to 600 science teachers in this room not long ago in a huge auditorium. It was, not the, it was a little bit intimidating. But when my mom's sitting back there, guys, I was a mess. <laughs> well, I had her pretty shook up in a hurry. She was a great prayer warrior. She was just unprepared for a 14-year-old wise guy to get in her face. And so she starts crying. Tears are flowing down her face, and, and she's losing the battle. And finally, she got so frustrated, and we had this, this, this Bible stand with this huge family Bible, big, thick, white cover. I'd never seen her lift it before by herself, you know. She runs over and grabs that big Bible. And I think, now I got her, because if she quotes something out of the big one that's not in the little one, hypocrite, you know, contradiction, got her, you know. Nah, she didn't do anything she's quoting. She just ran over and whacked me with it. That's why she got the big one. And guys, I got to tell you, it was not a love tap. She didn't, she belted me with this Bible. It shocked me, it scared me, and it hurt. And I turned it on her, and now I was mad. And I looked at her, and I pointed, and I said, I will show you. I made a vow right there at 14 that I was going to prove that God didn't exist and science had the answers. And guys, that's why I have all these degrees. Because I really tried. I belong to the, uh, you know, the Institute of Christian Research in San Diego. I'm an adjunct faculty member. I am part of several research projects. I worked on the Nautiloid Research Project down in uh, Grand Canyon. I, in fact, I convinced my wife to go on this little vacation raft ride down to Colorado. Eight days. She found out what a class five rapids is. <laughs> she would have killed me if she could have. But guys, I've been down the Grand Canyon so many times, the mountain goats know me by name. I've worked on the strata, the, the nautiloids. I was at Mount St. Helens many times. I've led people into Mount St. Helens. I do a lot of research there. We've dated the rocks there. I worked, I'm one of the scientists on the Hansen Research Project with Dr. Kurt Wise from Harvard, Dr. St uh, Lane Kennedy from USC. Uh, been there, done that. I really tried to prove that God doesn't exist. And then in 1987, I finally crumbled and ended up at a church I swore I'd never set foot in, and that was Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa. But it was as a result of what I saw 
not what somebody told me. The things, the geologic catastrophism that I observed at Mount St. Helens was absolutely incredible. I saw canyons carved. As Roger showed last night, that canyon, by the way, is 150 feet deep, a quarter mile wide, and 15 miles long. And it was carved through solid bedrock in a little over eight hours. 600 feet of strata laid down in just six minutes. Colification, fossilization, all of these things happening right before my eyes. A whole new explanation, another alternative. This was Newport. There's the cove. You can see the cove. That's the Colonel Mar Cove where I was throwing water balloons off that ledge. I was ended up being baptized in that same area. Well, guys, I got so hardened that I, when I finally could leave home, they were glad to see me go when I went to college. And actually, I took a little tour through the military. The 60s was an interesting time. Because I got to the point where I wouldn't open a birthday card or a, or a Christmas card or anything from any member of my family. I mean, I could get a birthday card and I could hold it up to the light and see a check or a gift certificate. I'd throw it in the trash. Because I knew if I opened it, it would say, praise the Lord, Jesus loves you, some of that nonsense. Guys, that's how hardened I had become. So it took a volcano to blow up in my face in 1980 to convince me that there was God and I wasn't Him. Isn't that something? But it still took seven years because it blew up in 1980 and it wasn't until 1987 that I stumbled into Calvary Chapel. I remember that first day I ended up in the parking lot of Calvary Chapel and I don't know how I got there. I wasn't drunk, I wasn't drinking, I wasn't using drugs and I wouldn't even drive down Sunflower because I didn't want to go by that church with those Jesus freaks. I'm sitting there in the parking lot and this little stubby guy comes walking by, Pastor Romaine. Talk about a life-changing experience. <laughs> but guys, I only lasted six months. 1987, I accepted Christ. I was baptized. I, I, my sister gave me this brand new King James Bible with a leather cover with a dove on it. Boy, I was ready. I just never opened it. I ended up throwing it away and walking back into the world because I couldn't figure out how to be a scientist and a Christian. And so that's what I want to tell you. Some of us have a little bit more difficulty being led to the Lord, don't we? This is like my dog when I take her to the vet. I ain't going. Well, that was me. You can't force me. But God has a plan. And with a little love and a little prayer, it can change your whole attitude, can it? Well, guys, right here is where it started. You're going to hear the last words of David Johnston. You're going to see what it was like, what he saw, and some of the things that for the first time we had an eyewitness account that I could no longer hide from. We're going to talk about the math tonight, uh, or this afternoon, and find out, like Roger was saying, you know, uh, to find a winning lotto ticket every single day for a thousand years, uh, the math, guys, just absolutely devastates spontaneous generational life. Evolution is dead. In fact, it is so bankrupt. And by the way, we've got to be careful how we use that term, you know, like he was saying. Evolution, by the way, is not a dirty word. It just means change. But if you add micro or macro in front of it, it changes the definition, and that's where we're going to go. Well, you're going to see what it was like at Mount St. Helens. Here we go. Because that was a pretty terrifying event. And David Johnson was on a ridge that was five miles away. It's named in honor of him now. Johnson Observatory is built right on top of it. He saw it coming and he's screaming on the radio, Vancouver, Vancouver, this is it. He was calling headquarters in Vancouver. And David wasn't even supposed to be on the ridge, by the way. Harry Glicken was supposed to be there. But David uh, ended up being killed that morning along with 57 other people. Guys, that, that volcano leveled enough trees to build 650,000 three-bedroom homes in six minutes. 
It laid down 600 feet of strata in uh, a matter of minutes. It created an 800-foot wave. It was the largest landslide in recorded history. A half a cubic mile of landslide debris left that mountain. Half of it went into the Spirit Lake and created this big wave that scoured the bank on the other side and drug trees back that were very significant. I've got... I have a piece of rock here I'm going to show you. This is a piece of rock from the lava dome. The mag and by the way, the dome is growing again. I've got some actual, some of the dust, the real powdery, and you touch it, it's like real fine talcum powder, but when you rub it, you can feel the grit. Because that mountain changed my life, folks. I saw things happen. It was my own eyes that I could no longer hide from. I couldn't mess with the math. You know, I, I, you heard me say I'm a, my PhD is in evolution bio, evolutionary biology with an emphasis in herpetology. I have a degree in geology. All of these ologies. Guys, ology just means the study of. If we apply the math, honestly, we find out how well our ology is doing. But see, we mess with the math. And so I was able to see for the first time the alternative geologic catastrophism, things that I had assumed took millions of years, like that canyon. If you walked into that canyon and you didn't know how it got there, you would say it took millions of years for that canyon to, to get there. If you saw that strata, you would say it took you know wet years, dry years, over millions of years it was laid down. It happened quickly. So there was an alternative. I saw coalification, fossilization, all these things happening right before my eyes. This is inside the crater. This was in 1992. You see steam coming out of the top and you see the snow, but we went in there and I went in there to get, whoops, back up here. I went in there to retrieve samples of that lava dome. That lava dome that you see in there is 1,000 feet high and 2,000 feet around. But it cooled and slowly as it built up, it cooled and crystallized into an igneous rock called dacite. We were able to take this rock and prepare it and send it to the same labs that I had used as a secular scientist. And we got some interesting dates for 12 year old rock. I'm going to ask you a question that I ask, uh, it'll help for this later this afternoon and, and just to see what page, we're, if we're all on the same page. But you're in good company. I asked 600 science teachers this question. I asked 1,700 people up in Colorado Springs this question. I asked 400 people at a family camp at Mount Hermon this question. Then I ask us Christian high school uh, kids this question, a public high school. I ask people all around the world this question. And it's amazing the answer I get. If I just need to know how many of you, I won't call on you, I just want to know how many people in this room have some basic clue, some concept of how we date fossils. You've read it, heard it, seen it. You have a basic clue. Raise your hand. So about 90% of you or more. Anybody brave enough to tell me the number one way we date fossils? Carbon. Now, when I asked those 600 science teachers that question, I expected a bunch of scientific answers. But you know what I got? It was like a choir. They all went, all at the same time. Carbon 14. I was stunned. Guys, carbon 14 cannot date fossils and never has been used to date fossils. So why is it everybody tells me that? See, carbon-14 can date carbon-based items. You are carbon-based life forms. We could date you, get some interesting dates. We can date the frozen rhinos, the woolly mammoths. We can date the uh, mummies in the tombs. We can date real bone. Because you can't date rock using carbon-14. You see how that deception works? There's the problem. Guys, carbon-14 is a good dating procedure used with dendrochronology, you can come up with a ballpark figure up to about 10,000 years. After that, carbon-14 drops into the abyss. Stephen Gould wouldn't stretch it past 70,000. So even if carbon-14 was this magic dating procedure, everybody says it is, how do you get a date of 3.7 million for Australopithecus africanus? You all know her, right? <laughs> Lucy? Australopithecus ramatus, 65 million. How do you get million year dates for, with something that can't date in the millions of years? Nobody bothers to ask it. I hear kids tell me, well, carb scientists, carbon dated that dinosaur. Guys, that's impossible. Mathematically, scientifically, flat wrong. I want to give you a little thing. We're going to talk about it tonight. I'll get into radioisotopes. You've all heard of uranium. 
Uranium is radioactive. Uranium-238, it's radioactive. It decays into the daughter product called lead, which is non-radioactive. And we can measure how long it takes. But guys, you can only use radioisotopes to date igneous rock. Where are fossils found? Sedimentary rock. Guys, I want to tell you something right here and right down today. There is no known method to date a fossil, period. Zero. So why are we in such a big tizzy over it and people fighting and screaming and yelling and all oh, the earth's billions and millions? How do we know? We don't. We just want it to be, so we make it that way. We created the geologic column. But see, here I have a piece of igneous rock that I know how old it is. It's 12 years old. We took it, sent it to the labs. Guys, the youngest date we got for this rock was 390,000, all the way up to 1.7 million. And we know it's only 12 years old. Well, people say, well, you know, it's been mixed because of the volcano. Well, that's true. It has. So that tells you there's no way to get an accurate date of anything. And you certainly can't come up with dates of 1.7, 1.8. You could come up with possibly, if you wanted to believe the earth was 4.5 billion, then every rock would have to be 4.5 billion because it's been mixed, you see. That would be the only thing you could do. There is no way because you can't date fossils, sedimentary rock using anything. And we're going to talk more about that tonight. Guys, I found a Pachycephalosaurus skull. It was the only one found at this dinosaur dig. My mom said that was a great find. Pachy means thick, you know, like pachyderm, thick skin, pachycephala, thick headed. I found it. <laughs> you ought to see the dates we got for this stuff. Guys, I found a piece of wood in this same 65 million year layer. The piece of wood was solid rock on one end, in the middle it was coal. And at the, at the very end of it, it was wood. It was a soft species of pine that we could date. And it came from Canada. What's it doing out there in the 65 million year old layer? Guys, bone in a vacuum will not last for millions of years if it doesn't turn to rock. If the cells are not replaced by minerals turning it to stone, it turns to dust. I have a piece of coal here. I found it. Sent it off to the lab came up with a date of 2200 years for coal. Coal is carbon. You can date it. The problem is this piece of coal is a two by four out of this girl shower house at Mount Hermon. How accurate are our dating procedures? Guys, they're junk. And if in fact this earth was covered by a flood as stated in Genesis, then it's all suspect anyway. Look at this quote from Professor George Wald. George is a professor emeritus. This is out of Scientific American. He is a professor of biology and the Nobel Prize winner in biology in 1971. Guys, this is no slouch, and he's certainly not a Christian. Look what he says. There are only two possible explanations as to how life arose. Spontaneous generation arising to evolution or a supernatural creative act of God. There is no other possibility. Now, this is from a secular scientist, guys, not from me. And he's not a theologian. See, so there's only two choices. Now look. He says, spontaneous generation was scientifically disproved 120 years ago by Louis Pasteur and others. But that leaves us with only one other possibility, that life came as a supernatural creation, act of creation of God. He says, now this is an honest man. This is a man I can sit down and have coffee with. He says, I can't accept that philosophy because I do not want to believe in God. Guys, that is one of the choices that you have. God says you have the ability to make choices. And you can choose not to believe in God. And that's all right. Not smart, but you can do it. But don't come to me and say you don't believe in God because of all the evidence. Because there isn't any. You can say you don't want to believe in God because you don't want to. And we're friends. Because look what George, George, this great scientist says. Therefore, I choose to believe in that which I know is scientifically impossible. Spontaneous generation leading to evolution. Guys, this is from a... Harvard-trained scientist. Do you see what I'm getting at? And as we go on tonight, this afternoon, and tomorrow, see, when you can sit here like this, and like I said, this was one of my idols, one of my heroes. He is an honest man. And I have no problem with that. Say, I choose to believe in that which I know is scientifically impossible. Because I do not want to believe in God. Now, that's a legitimate statement. But I get really upset when people come, well, all the evidence, you know, how can you ignorant Christians believe this? There's so much evidence against God. Guys, we're going to talk about Mary Schweitzer tonight. Mary found some soft tissue 
some red blood cells in a T-Rex bone. Guys, I found Triceratops horn. I found T-Rex knuckle joints. I've, but I've never found one with a Polaroid, so I, I find it really interesting how we come up with some of the descriptions. But this takes us, look, Romans 1.20, For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that all men are without excuse. Guys, this, look at the date on this, April 2006, just two months ago. Brave new world, soft tissue found in dinosaur bones, shocks paleontology. What do you see tonight, this afternoon, what I have now? and what Mary and the scientific community has come up with. But look at this. This is out of the, that article, the discovery. It says, the most significant paleontological advance in the past 25 years was the discovery this year by Mary Schweitzer and Jennifer Whitmire of soft, flexible blood vessels and cells in the cortical bone of Tyrannosaurus rex. Guys, that's impossible. Flat impossible. You cannot have soft tissue, blood, red blood cells in a bone that's millions of years old. There is a problem. Either the bone isn't millions of years old, or we have some other problems. So we'll talk about that this afternoon. See, here is what I was telling you in the book. This is, in 1859, the book, Origin of the Species by Means of Natural Selection, was published by Charles Darwin. The subtitle was both equally important in revealing the preservation of favored races and the struggle for life. Guys, if you buy into that Darwinian evolution, you are a racist. You know that Hitler had one of the finest collections of Darwinian memorabilia? He had, all, he had notes and books. And you know that some of the Nazi war criminals, when they were interviewed, said they were just helping evolution? And after this book was published in 1859, people went out and shot aborigines, took them to a taxidermist, had them mounted and put in a museum case. So let's just keep preaching evolution, folks. You see, it's just nonsense. And what about Darwin? Did he have a, an agenda? I think so. Look at what he says. The Old Testament from its manifestly false history of the earth was no more to be trusted than the sacred books of the Hindus or the beliefs of any barbarian. The New Testament is a damnable doctrine. I can hardly see how anyone ought to wish Christianity to be true. Well, I had somebody say, well, didn't Darwin change and believe in Jesus? Well, he does now, but he didn't make a deathbed confession. But see, even Darwin said, balancing facts, he says, for I am w well aware that scarcely a single point is discussed in this volume on which facts cannot be adduced, often apparently leading to conclusions directly opposite to those in which I have arrived. A fair result can be obtained only by fully stating and balancing the facts and arguments on both sides of the question. Guys, that's all I'm asking. I'm not attacking scientists like I said, I am one. I just think that we need to teach everything. Darwin himself said it. So why is it we're making one illegal and one can be taught? And, and when we try to say, well, you can't teach creation because that's metaphysical, that's religion, when in fact they are both religions. And this afternoon, we're going to show you exactly what that means. But here's where we need to go. This is where we're going to leave it right now. Let God be true and every man a liar. Guys, thank you. We'll be back here uh, to talk. And, and if you've got some friends that are... Uh, on the line or have some questions, you come back this afternoon and we're going to really hit it. I'm going to start with information. I'm going to talk about Stephen Hawking uh, and particularly the math and I'll make it fun and interesting. Thanks, folks. Amen. Thank you. <laughs> well, I know one person in the building that really was excited was your brother back there, Roger Oakland. He was really liking that, that presentation. I loved it, um, but it takes a scientific mind to love it more than we can understand. He was understanding it, being a teacher the same way. and That's yeah, just a biologist, Jim. Well, we're going to take a break, and then uh, we're going to go out in the parking lot and drag race up and down. <laughs> you know, it wasn't, we weren't really drag racing. I put on their second album a new album, and my car wouldn't stop. <laughs> it is so good. It just makes you want to floor it, you know, right down the pedal to the metal. And, and that, that music playing there and the wind blowing in your hair. And they were ahead of me, actually. <laughs> I only have an you know, old truck there. But anyway, the Lord bless you. Just take a break, and um, 
We're excited, and this rock here is so old. <laughs> it's older than it used to be, though. Now it's 92, 10.